Hello, YouTube viewers. Thanks for tuning in. This is Remington H, KG5RJS. And today I'm going to discuss the software I use at my amateur ham station. The various programs I use include rig control software, software to control the transceiver, in my case an IC7300, using the computer. Also, digital mode applications, sometimes called Digimode software or digital modem software, software to log contacts or QSOs, and manage requested and validated QSLs. Also, I use tools to upload QSOs to online services, such as Logbook of the World, EQSL, Clublog, etc. Now, this isn't going to be a detailed software setup or operation video. There are many videos on YouTube already detailing setup and configuration of the various software applications I use. This is more of a demonstration of how these applications come together and work in my particular ham shack. First, I'm going to talk about the actual hardware, the computer setup I use. Now, there's nothing fancy here. You really don't need any exotic configuration. You just need fairly modern, within reason, hardware. And with about 8 gigs of RAM, I found seems to be appropriate. The Stell Optiplex 390 was upgraded from an i3-2120 to an i5-2400, from dual core to quad cores, and upgraded from 4 gigs to 8 gigs of RAM. Now originally this, this machine was a bit slow at decoding and also tended to thrash the hard drive, which affected Digimode software decoding and oftentimes the computer would tend to temporarily lock up, which was quite frustrating. Upgrades to the computer hardware certainly did help. Uh, probably more importantly, updates to the Digimode software applications themselves. Those updates substantially improved Digimode decoding performance and reliability. The computer works fine and fast and is still responsive, though an SSD upgrade would be welcome. First, I'll talk briefly about the rig control software I use, ICOMS RSBA1. With this software, I have easy access to the front panel controls of my IC7300. Also, many of the controls are accessible right on this panel. Many of these controls are a menu or even a few menus deep on the radio. So it's a lot easier for me to access functions like noise blanker, noise reduction, compressor, RF power, of course the VFO, and RSBA1 also provides the ability to view the band scope on the computer screen. And I can adjust the band scope edges here. This is showing me the full 20 meter band. This is showing me some CW and digital modes. This is showing me the voice portion of the band for the general class. And I can even just select signals to listen to. No subjects only at this time. Come down. RSBA1 is primarily targeted at people who want to control their rig over a network, either a LAN or even over the internet. There are server and client components of the application. I don't use it over a network. I just use it to control the rig that's plugged directly into the computer via a USB cable. Next, I'll show the logging software I use called Log4OM, which I believe is short for Log for Old Man. I've never actually heard anybody re refer to it as such. Now, previously, I didn't use any logging software at all on the Shack computer, and I just manually entered QSOs into QRZ when I felt necessarily. It wasn't something I was particularly concerned about. However, once I discovered WSJTX and by necessity JT Alert, yes. which I'll discuss in a bit, it became apparent that I needed a logging application to interface with these Digimode applications. I chose Log for OM because of the simple and relatively seamless integration with JT Alert. It also integrates easily with other apps that can communicate via UDP or user datagram protocol. That connection is made possible by the included log for om communicator component. It can also pull ADIF, or Amateur Data Interchange Format, files. And it can update and import continuously in real time. 
Now I'm going to assume most of you watching this video probably know what WSJTX is and does, but I'll show how it works with what I believe to be an indispensable companion application called JT Alert. Now this of course is WSJTX and WSJTX alone shows you here under band activity all the uh, signals and all the decodes received within the passband, in this case about 3 kilohertz. And on the right, we have all signals that are shown under my receive frequency. So generally, you see everything here and you see your particular QSOs here. Now, what are we looking at here? So we have existing QSOs. Decodes that aren't green are other people talking to each other and exchanging grids, signal reports, 7.3s, etc. The green highlighted signals, decodes, are CQs that we can respond to. The problem with WSJTX on its own is it doesn't really give us a lot of information. I don't have memorized what all these call signs are and where they're from. So like I, I, I can tell certainly American, United States call signs, but some of these others, I don't know where they necessarily are. Is, is this England? I think so. I think this is in South America. Not sure where that is. VE, I believe that's uh, Canada. Also, I don't know if, for example, American call signs here, I don't know if these are states that I need. I don't know if they're grids I need. I don't know if some of these DXCCs I need. I just have call signs. Also important is I don't know if I've worked these particular operators before. Have I worked K8YFM in the past? If I have, I don't really necessarily need to work him again. You know, we're not having rag choose here. We're just exchanging call signs, signal reports, making and logging contacts. So this really isn't particularly useful on its own. You can certainly make some impressive contacts with very little power, even work the world, but it doesn't really help you much in achieving goals you might have, like work all states, the XCC awards, etc. Now let's add JT Alert. I'm going to go ahead and launch JT Alert here and let it run a bit, and let's see what JT Alert provides. JT Alert brings up this docked window at the top here. It's docked on top of the WSJTX application. And as you can see, it's providing us more information. Now, the way I have this configured, anything gray is states I do not need. Now, I, I still may need the prefix or the grid, but that's not really something I'm shooting for right now, so I have those alerts turned off. Anything highlighted red in my configuration is a CQ. So N9 Kilo Tango is from Indiana is calling CQ. Kilo Echo 5, Papa Charlie Victor in Louisiana is calling CQ. I can see his signal report, how strongly I'm receiving him. In this case, negative 14. N9 KT, I'm receiving a pretty strong negative 9. So I can tell that there's a good chance if I did want to respond to this CQ, I'm going to make contact. At least they'll receive my signal. Especially important is if I have worked any of these signals before, a B4 message will appear. So I know that I don't need to work them again. I've already worked them in the past, and I don't need to waste their time, and I don't need to waste my time. JT Alert gives me good visibility as to what's happening in the band activity. If I want to respond to a CQ, all I need to do is simply click the CQ in the JT Alert window once, and immediately this computer will put the rig into transmit mode, and as soon as the next transmit cycle comes around, it'll go ahead and respond to the CQ. JT Alert can interface with a variety of different logging applications via standard ADIF files. Of particular importance to me is its ability to seamlessly interface with Log4OM. And as I had mentioned before, this is a very significant reason I chose Log4OM as my logger. All I have to do is enter the UDP port as configured here, and JT Alert can communicate to and from Log4OM. So JT Alert can 
automatically log my completed QSOs into Log4OM. JT Alert also uses the Log4OM database to keep track of call signs I've already worked, or as they call it, logged before. Log4OM will keep track of my QSLs, keep track of validated QSLs, validated from eQSL and Logbook of the World. And that's set up in the external logs. So in the external logs, I have log for OMs configured to log in to my eQSL logbook, my club log logbook, and logbook of the world. Automatically, log for OM will upload each contact to eQSL and club log and QRZ as I have this configured. I, ha I can manually download from those logbooks using QSL tools under QSL management. So I can click on eQSL, click download, and any updates like confirmed QSOs automatically get updated. Logbook of the world also, I can download my QSOs. Now I've already updated them recently, so there won't be much change here. Because log for om is now updated with my validated QSLs, JT Alert will now, because it interfaces with log for om knows validations. And when I go into settings, scan log and rebuild, and scan all, anything that has updated and validated will be updated here. So JT alert will no longer alert me about states I no longer need, or DXCCs I no longer need, or grids if I have it set up to do that. Now, logbook of the world, I don't automatically upload to. The ARRL, I believe, would prefer that you didn't have logging applications automatically log to their database because of the load on their servers. So what I have set up is in my logbook, I have QRZ interfaced with logbook of the world. And you can upload your TQSL file, your token file to them to give QRZ access to your logbook of the world log. and. After a couple days, after I've gathered some new QSOs, I can then just click them here. Anything green is already submitted to Logbook of the World, but just to show you, I would select whatever QSOs I want to select, and then I can send the QSOs and update my Logbook of the World Logbook. Thank you. Now let's look at an application called FL Digi for a moment. Now I'll assume most of you know what FL Digi is and does. It's a Digimode application, free to use, that works with many keyboard digital modes, such as PSK31, RTTY, Olivia, and other exotic digital mode protocols that allow for keyboard QSOs. Now once QSOs are completed within FL Digi, you just click, in my case, the log QSO macro, and that will trigger FL Digi to write to its own logbook file. That'll trigger FL Digi to write to its own FL Digi logbook.adi file. Now log for OM communicator is set up to receive inbound logs via polling the ADF file. As you can see here, enable file monitor. So log for OM is monitoring this logbook.adi file in the FL Digi directory. And periodically, very quickly, any updates to that log file by me logging a QSO will automatically import that record into Log4OM. So for example, this PSK31 QSO was logged automatically by FL Digi once I hit that log QSO macro button. Now I do have some problems or challenges that I've been working to sort out but haven't been entirely successful so far, and may not be until some updates or improvements are made to the software that I use. Most of these problems resolve around WSJTX and its ability to work simultaneously with other applications that use CAT control, short for Computer Aided Transceiver. For example, using RSBA1 and WSJTX simultaneously doesn't work. WSJTX will show an error accessing rig control. 
Controlling WSJTX with a rig control utility called OmniRig helps somewhat, but introduces a substantial transmit delay, which basically makes it impossible to use. I do use an application utility called Virtual Serial Ports Emulator by EtherLogic. And Virtual Serial Ports Emulator can create a virtual COM port that can be shared by multiple applications. That's really the only way I can run multiple applications that attempt to access the IC7300 simultaneously. It works somewhat. I can run RSBA1 rig control software along with FL Digi, for example, and I may be able to run RSBA1 along with Log4OM, but WSJTX doesn't work with it, unfortunately. In closing, I find using a primary central logging program like Log4OM and having Log4OM itself update online call logs like QRZ, Logbook of the World, EQSL, Club Log, works better than having each digital mode application update those logs separately. It keeps it more centralized, keeps it better organized. And using QRZ to update Logbook of the World, rather than each individual Digimode applications update Logbook of the World separately, satisfies ARRL's request that you not upload and update constantly to keep the load lower on their servers, which I'm happy to do. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions or concerns or comments, certainly please feel free to comment down below. Most importantly, if you have any suggestions I should take into consideration to improve my, my setup, I'd certainly appreciate that. Don't forget to like the video, and if you enjoy this content and would like some more, please don't forget to subscribe. Thank you, and 7-3.